from James Bond definitely would have come up with. Because this is your typical style of shield, circular with four gold bosses on the front. But then behind each of those bosses is a pistol. And how it works is you hold it, you pull a little lever behind, and you can fire two shots at a time. So you get four shots. Pretty ingenious idea, the enemy's not going to know that's coming. Um, but there, there is a, a major flaw to this weapon, because this is still a barrel loading weapon. So to load this, you've got to put the gunpowder down the barrel. You've got to put your little musket ball down the barrel. There's a little stick underneath it. That little stick is to prime it all home. Now it can take between 20 and 30 seconds to load one of these things. So that's up to two minutes to load the entire thing. I'll tell you now, two minutes is a long time to stand still on a battlefield. Wouldn't recommend it. So, um, it's most uses that you use it as a first response weapon. You run into battle, find your first opponent, bang, find your second opponent, bang, and then you draw your sword and use that for the rest of the battle. Because of that very limited use, and this being very expensive to make, you don't see them around very often. But I do think it's a, it's a clever idea that they came up with. Now, of course, for all of these weapons, you are going to need some armour to protect yourself. And the original type of armour they had in India is this stuff here in the middle, scale armour. Now originally these scales were metal scales, which are basically little cones of metal that are sewn onto a coat so they overlap to create a glancing surface. So remember that candar that's hacking and slashing away, you will hack onto your coat and slide down the scales and off your body, giving you that protection. It works relatively well against those hacking and slashing attacks, However, very sharp objects like arrows can puncture through. And you mentioned that little cat are those daggers, but they're just going to go up and underneath those scales. So they do upgrade it later on. But just to leave you a bit of detail on this particular one, because this obviously is the metal scales. These are animal scales. Uh, this is an animal called a pangolin, it's a type of anteater. Uh, and this particular one was given to King George III by the government of Bengal as a sort of nice gift. Uh, and it really is a very nice gift because each of those scales has been hand painted in real gold paint. So uh, a very nice gift. It's actually on loan to us from the Royal Collection, so it's uh, a very stunning piece. There's very few scale coats that actually exist because they either reuse them later on or because of the conditions, the very wet conditions in India, hot and humid, they actually they rust away quite a lot. So it's one of the very few examples of a scale coat to show you. But they said they did move on from this, and what they moved on to were things like mail. And there's a beautiful example of chain mail in the next case of Mars. So if you want to move along a little bit. Do you want me to tell you about a sword? <laughs> um, I usually sometimes make a joke about an elephant in the room, but since we have one, it can't be. Uh, just before we move on, then, it's going to be nice. I'll tell you a little bit about this uh, ex executioner's sword, this huge sword here. Now, this belonged to the, the Nawa of Ust, Ust who was a tribal leader. And basically, the, when the British came along, uh, they went up to him and asked him, uh, would he like to be a king? And he said, oh yes, thank you very much, I would very much like to be a king. This is fine, of course you can be a king, as long as, of course, you do everything we tell you. To sweeten the deal a little bit, the British gave him what they called trappings of kingship. So they gave him things like a throne and this huge executioner's sword to display and show his power and wealth. Um, now, what I like about this is obviously it's display his power and wealth, but if you actually look closely at the sword, you might notice that stamped right in the middle of the blade is a very British symbol. It's actually a Scottish symbol from the <laughs> Scottish makers who made the blade. So uh, if you look closely, you'll obviously realise the, sort of pa the power behind it. And one of the most common questions I get asked about this is, how did they use it? Well, I'll give you a clue. Uh, it weighs 30 kilos, and it took six people to load it into the case. <laughs> so it, it was never used. It was purely just for, for display and put it behind so everyone could see his wealth and power. And it's a, a really interesting item. So if we move back along to our, uh, our mail, you're welcome. Hmm. Create a shirt. Now, what I quite like about Indian Mail is if you look how tiny those links are, 
I mean, this is handmade. So, I mean, I would go cross-eyed trying to make this. It's absolutely tiny. Um, now, Indian mail is absolutely brilliant. I mean, it's good protection from those slashing attacks, even from stabbing attacks. Arrows are not going to get through there. And as long as you have a, uh, a padded jacket underneath, that actually cushions a lot of the blows. So, for example, if someone attacks you with an axe, well, the mail will stop that axe from chopping your arm off, and the padded jacket will reduce that from, instead of being broken your arm, it'll reduce it down to a severe bruising, which, of course, is much better. Um, now, the other reason I like Indian mail is, well, because I'm a girl, and I like pretty things. <laughs> and Indian mail is just so pretty. If you look closely, you might spot it's got this beautiful diamond pattern that runs across the entirety of the mail. And they do this simply by using two different types of metal. In this case, it's iron and brass. Uh, although some of you might realize uh, that brass isn't exactly the strongest of metals, so by doing this, you actually make it weaker. Um, but I can't really complain. I walk around in four and a half inch heels, so I'm used to having things look pretty but not practically any use. Um, but it is a beautiful piece. But the problem is, it's good protection against certain things, but when Firearms start to be introduced to the battlefield, and particularly muskets. Mail isn't very good. Actually, it probably makes it a bit worse. Because you imagine a musket ball hitting you in the mail. It's not going to stop that musket ball. It's going to go through that mail, through your shirt, and into your body. Usually taking those little metal rings with it as well. So it's not a very nice thing. So they decide, we need plate armour. Now in Europe, we want a full plate armour, head to toe. You don't get this in India. There's two very good reasons. One, it's very hot in India, and if you decide to stand in a, a small suit of armour in an Indian battlefield, what you've done is created an oven. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. So, they don't do this. Well, they do come up with... Uh, so, the other reason is they don't have the metal. There's two types of metal in India. They've got very high quality metal, which is what they use for their weapons, and they've got lesser quality. Now, this isn't poor quality metal, it's just slightly lesser. And this is the stuff they use for them, armour. And to make enough armour that it's bulletproof, you have to make it very, very thick. So instead, they think about what they want to protect, and they come up with what's known as the four mirrors. So these two panels on the side, one on the front and one on the back. And this is designed to protect your vital organs. Or in some cases, dropped a little bit lower, to protect your stomach area. Because you can imagine in battle, that's not a very nice route to have. So this is the sort of armour that they sort of developed onto. Now I'm going to finish on my last two objects, which are my two favourite in this gallery. And the first one is this oh, horse armour directly behind me. <laughs> it is only attached to the horse by the tail, a hole in the ears, and a little strap across the front. So you can just picture yourselves riding on this. It's going to shift, it's going to shake, and really flap around in the wind. Not exactly the best. But then again, it wasn't supposed to be. This armour was designed for the Great Exhibition down in London in 1851. And what they wanted to show was what Indian horse armour looked like. There's only one small problem. There was no one left alive who knew how to make it. So they took a guess. I'll give them a little bit of credit. It's not that bad. Uh, you would use mail for a horse's body. It's just good protection for yourself, so just as good for a horse. If you look closely, you might spot the diamond crisscrossing patterns on the mail there, so they've got that right as well. But when you were doing this, you'd make sure it was really wrapped a bit more tight around the body. Not rigidly tight, but tight enough that it's not going to move. And of course, you'd never put mail on a horse's face. Uh, horses are fright dolls, particularly if you cover their eyes. And mail has a tendency to move around a little bit too much. What's sad about this item is by about 1800, uh, no one was asking for armourers to make horse armour anymore because they didn't need it. So all these hundreds of years, these trade secrets have been passed down all of these years, uh, simply died with these men. So 50 short years later, when they want to make this, there was no one left alive who knew how to make it. I think it's a bit like us forgetting how to make pencils in 50 years' time, because we all use our fingers on our iPads. 
Uh, so it's quite a sad, sad story about how a skill can be lost so very quickly. Uh, now I'm going to finish on my last object, which is my ultimate favourite one, and it's the one everybody walks past without realising what it is. So it's a fascinating item, so I'm going to make sure everyone sees it. And it's just around the corner. in a little bit. A bit of a tight space, this one. Uh, so I, I usually make a joke about a wizard's hat at this point. <laughs> uh, so this is a coit turban, and it belonged to a group of warrior Sikhs called, known as the Akolis or the Immortals. Um, there's a picture on the side of the, 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 uh, coit, the turban there to show you what they looked like. They often wore blue to battle so you could identify them. Now these guys were a highly revered set of warriors. And these guys were trained in swordsmanship, archery, firearms, even western techniques of battle. So these were not the guys you wanted to meet on the battlefield. Either armed, or what would appear to be unarmed. Because this is what they're wearing on their heads. Now it looks innocent until you start to look a little bit closer. So you've got these circles that wrap around the outside. Those are the chakra, or the coits. Now originally, they would have been gilded in gold, and on the outside, razor sharp. The Akalis were trained to remove them, spin them around their fingers, and flick them at their enemy with deadly speed and accuracy. Now this was used for about the 16th up to the 19th century, so all those hundreds of years you can imagine how skilled they became with this particular weapon. It's a pretty deadly one. They also even had slightly bigger ones that they held on their hip as almost like frisbees. Um, but what I quite like about this, um, this particular piece is that's not the only thing on there. There is more to it. Because you've got the, that, that lovely wire that's wrapped around the middle. That's quite a useful wire. You can use that for all sorts of things, from attacking your opponents to stringing across a path to create an ambush. But that's not all. There is still more. If you look closely, inside that wire are what look like three arrowheads. So there's one on this side and there's two on the opposite side. Those are flick knives. To flick at your enemy's eyes to take them out. So I said used for a very, very long time and uh, the Akalis were exceedingly well trained with this and they could use it to uh, definitely their best of their ability. Um, so I like to finish on it because I said most people walk past without realising what sort of weapon it is and I, I think it's a fascinating item. I want to thank you very much for listening to this talk. Please have a look around the gallery. There's some stunning items in not just our Indian collection, but our Oriental collection in general. But otherwise, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day here at the Royal Armouries. Thank you for listening. Thank you.